Our topic is for today is the fluid and electrolyte homeostasis. The body needs an appropriate amount of fluid, especially to maintain the normal circulation. Now, the water content of the body is usually is proportional to the body weight. It's depending on the gender. Female, usually an adult one, has about 55% of the total body water volume, while a male has about 60%. In the children, relatively, we do have more water comparing to the lipids. Now, that's very, very important because those drugs that usually is distributed in the water compartment, they have to adjust, let's see, the dose depending on the water content. In adult one, especially in the elderly one, the lipid content relatively increases while the water content is going to decrease. Now let's see how this total water is going to be distributed. The total water, for example, a 75 kilogram patient has about 60%, so 45 liter of the water. Now this water is taking place in two thirds in the intracellular spaces. Why? The other one third is in the extracellular spaces. In the extracellular spaces we do have the interstitial volume and the blood volume. Very, very important that the total body water usually is, can be accessed only from the blood, only from the intracellular volume. Now, what are the differences between these water spaces? Now, if you look at, for example, the extracellular spaces, relatively the ion content of sodium, potassium and other ions are equal. Only difference made by the protein content. So the oncotic pressure is going to maintain the equilibrium between the blood volume and the interstitial volume. However, the all water content is regulated by the blood volume or the plasma volume. Now the difference between the extracellular spaces and the intracellular spaces, the water content, is the ion disturbance. Relatively, we do have less sodium in the intracellular spaces, more potassium. Why? In the extracellular one, we do have the opposite one, more sodium and less potassium. So that's membrane potential is going to maintain the uh, division between the extracellular and the intracellular spaces. It's very, very important, as I mentioned already, that this body water only regulated from the blood. So the intake of the water usually is distributed into the blood volume, in the extracellular volume, and the extracellular has an equilibrium between the uh, uh, intracellular and the extracellular one. Why we do have a loss through the respiration, for example, the skin loss and the kidney loss. Another important one that if you are looking at, the blood volume takes about 10 or 11 percent all the total body water. So anything that is influencing the total body water only influences the blood volume by 10 percent. If you do have a volume intake or any kind of water intake that has the same uh, ion uh, composition as the extracellular one, it takes about one third of the total uh, water content. Now what are the physiological importance of the body water? Basically, if we are losing water very soon and very rapidly, that can cause cerebral dehydration and can cause the rupture of the small blood vessels and cerebral hemorrhage can develop. If we do gradually lose the water, relatively the body is, can accommodate to this one and can produce some osmotically active molecules intracellular, especially in the brain. And what will happen if you want to suddenly rehydrate the patient? Now, cerebral edema is going to develop because the brain intracellular milieu has a little bit increased osmolarity. This is why the water can move into the neurons and that can cause cerebral edema. Another, when we do have too much, let's see, water. This is what is called a water intoxication. When we ingest too much hypotonic solution, and that directly can cause cerebral edema. The opposite is, well, very similar is going to happen when we have a water intoxication that gradually 
uh, develops because in this way the brain can lose the active molecules, intraselective molecules, so the dehydration relatively can cause a problem, a neural problem. Now, if we do have the water intoxication that develops chronically, relatively asymptomatic, or maybe the blood pressure, it can be increased. Now, let's see the equilibrium or the water daily balance. What we do have, we do have an obligatory water loss through the kidney. The kidney produces about 600 milliosmol of substances. These are the metabolites that produce during the metabolic processes daily. Now, considering the maximum concentrating capability of the kidney, these 600 milliosmol particles can be excreted in 500 ml of urine because the kidney can concentrate about four times comparing to the serum osmolarity. So four times mil, 1200 milliosmol. Now the skin and lung, this is what is called insensible perspiration, that takes about 900 ml daily. Of course, if you do have fever or do have any kind of increased temperature, that is going to increase this insensible respiration, perspiration, but every centigrade takes about 100 ml extra water needs. We are losing similarly water through the intestine through the stool and a normal composition of the stool takes about 100 ml per day however if you have diarrhea you are going to lose much more water by this way now if you summarize this this means the obligatory loss that there's a minimum one about 1.5 liter now what will happen how can we gain some water relatively we do produce some water to the oxidative metabolism that takes about 400 ml and if you subtract the 400 out of the 1.5 liter it means we do have at least 1.1 liter daily water intake to have a normal water balance in our body now, what's going to regulate the fluid electrolyte homeostasis in our body? Basically, the angiotensin relatively, that's the most important one, when it's going to affect it by when the extracellular fluid volume is going to decrease, this is going to trigger the renin release and that's renin angiotensin aldosterone system is going to turn on. So what will happen? The periphery and the afferent artery of vasoconstriction and the blood pressure starts to increase and the GFR is going to decrease. So the kidney usually takes out about 20% of the total uh, cardiac output. So this can be regulated by only influencing the GFR. The aldosterone that usually triggered by angiotensin 2 and partially ACTH and by the serum potassium concentration. What will happen? What is the aldosterone? Aldosterone affecting the sodium potassium ATPase on the basolateral membrane or tubular epithelial cells and stimulates in the distal tubus and the collecting duct. So what will happen? We are going to reabsorb the sodium and the sodium followed by the water and we are pushing out, we secrete the potassium. And of course, the angiotensin does have an effect of the peripheral uh, vessel stone as well, so it causes vas uh, peripheral vasoconstriction. Another one, the vasopressin of the ADH, the antidiuretic hormone, that again is stimulated when the extracellular fluid osmolarities increases or the volume decreases. And if you do have an increase of angiotensin 2, or we do have a signal from the baroreceptors, what will happen? The ADH that is regulating the water permeability on the collecting duct, the aquaporin who is going to be uh, translocated to the membrane and let the water comes with the salt. So this is how it's regulating the water reabsorption. And of course, Vasopressin has some other effect as well, but peripheral vasoconstriction can develop. The anti-nitriatic peptide that uh, usually is uh, triggered by the atrial valve distension, and that's in, uh, causing a natriuresis, angiotensin 2, aldosterone antagonist. And this is why the extracellular fluid decreases and the blood pressure is going to decrease by this effect.
the regulation of the exocellular fluid is less precise comparing to the osmolarity regulation, and osmolarity is directly connected to the serum sodium concentration. The regulation and the different situation that can be obtained if we do have any kind of changes of the volume or on the osmolarity. So the possible number of the changes is about 9 if you calculate 3 times 3 because we can alter the extracellular volume such as we can increase, can be normal or can be decreased. While the tonicity or the osmolarity can be hypo, can be normal or can be hyper. Let's look at these nine different classes or changes. Now, this is a little bit more complicated table, but let's go step by step. The first row that you can see here, that's when we do have an increased extracellular volume. And the columns, such as a hypotonicity, hyposmolarity, normosmolarity, and hyperosmolarity. What will happen when we do have an increased extracellular volume with a hypo osmotic milieu, such as, for example, there is an increased water intake. We are drinking too much or we are administering too much water, especially in psychiatric patients who has this uh, uh, polydipsia, when we are drinking too much, psychogenic polydipsia. Or somebody, for example, uh, infused rectally with some hyposmolar solution. Another problem can be when we do have a problem with the water excretion. If we do have, for example, renal fever, renal failure, and that doesn't let the water passing through, so the water retention happening. Or we do have a syndrome of inappropriate ADA secretion when we're always producing more concentrated urine, and the water retained and hyponatremia and hypervolemia is going to develop. And severe form of edema, that's due to be cardiac one, and those accompanying portal hypertension, such as the cirrhosis or hyperalbuminemic stages, or glucose infusion, especially when the patient, is, for example, is operated and cannot take any water or any, and cannot do anything itself or himself. Another one, the normosotic, uh, normal uh, tonic. Uh, over hydration, that relatively, if somebody is taking too much isotonic fluid, such as, for example, renal fluid, electrolyte retention, or somebody got more uh, physiological saline infusion, or they do have an increased salt intake, and this salt intake is associated with water intake as well, or uh, early mild forms of edema that can cause this isotonic and hypervolemia. The hypertonic hypervolemia can be due to some endocrine problems, such as a Kohn syndrome or Cushing syndrome. Or if somebody has too much salt intake, especially in a small children, accidentally, they're taking more salt than sugar. Or an oligoanuric patient, the extracellular sodium concentration correlates with the amount of ingested sodium or hypertonic sodium bicarbonate infusion, especially in severe lactic acidosis, and if it's treated with after the cardiac arrest. Another one that we do have a normal volume, but the sodium content is less normal or higher one. The low sodium consumption, for example, or if somebody is sweating a lot, plus replacing only drinking water without replacing the ions, they can develop a hyponatremic normovolemia. The normal state is a fine when we do have the same amount of fluid and the ions and the volume. Another one, if somebody has too much salt, especially at the and usually uh, only the transitional because the normal osmoregulatory system immediately and quickly would regulate it. Come only that could happen when the extracellular volume decreases, especially when we do have a less sodium that happening, for example, in Edison's disease, or if somebody overdoses by diuretics, why salt intake is very low, or if somebody the kidney has, has a kidney that's losing salt, or type 4 renal tubular acidosis, or ileus, or diarrhea in the early stage, or for example, a cystic fibrosis, that anything can cause a decrease of the volume and a decrease of the sodium content. 
if you do have a normal uh, normal tonic but low volume such as happening when we are losing electrolyte Excessive electrolyte such as burns or blood loss or vomiting diarrhea or renal loss as especially in asthenic pure, uh, polyuria another thing when we do develop a hypertonicity a hypernatremic hypovolemia that relatively when we lose too much water especially in an older person or in infant one because they don't for the elderly person they don't feel let's say to drink water and and especially in the summertime they uh, lose a lot of water and this is why they can develop hypernatremia or Another thing when we can have, for example, loss of hypotonic fluids, for example, if we do have an increased uh, perspiration, for example, in heavy muscle activity in a dry environment or in diabetes insipidus when we do have an osmotic diuresis and, and uh, or diabetic insipidus patient or sweating, these all things can develop or can cause dominantry water loss and loss of the extracellular volume and loss of the serum an increase of the serum now let's see the major regulatory system that we already mentioned some but let's follow it um, the electrolyte excretion or retention is followed by possible the water that's essential one so mainly the ion excretion and retention is regulated and the water followed following passively and of course it's altering by the vasopressin the permeability now uh, the volume regulation that affects the plasma compartment general but also the extracellular compartment as well a mechanism basically the some receptor the sensitive to the high and low pressure the blood volume or renin angiotensin aldosterone system and some endogenic natriuretic factors such as the uh, atrial natriuretic factor or BMP, renal PGE2 or PGI2 and that's all, that's all that all is important role to regulate the blood volume and ADH as well. Let's start to discuss the different situation, the most common situation. Let's start with when we do have a decreased extracellular volume. There are two differences, uh, possibilities, when we do have exicosis and we do have dehydration. The exicosis is usually happening when we are losing electrolyte and water as well. So we do develop hypovolemia and when we the interstitial fluid, it also decreases in this situation. So both the blood and the interstitium is decreased, so the extracellular space is involved. Dehydration, when only we lose water, or relatively losing much more water comparing to the ions. In this case, the all water compartment is affected. So not only the extracellular, but the intracellular as well. So relatively, here in this case, we, the blood volume affected about 10%, comparing to exicosis, when the blood volume decreased about 33%, one third. Now what can cause the loss of the extracellular volume? For example, GI loss, such as a vomiting or diarrhea, renal loss in diabetes mellitus of Addison diseases, or skin, lung, that's an insensible perspiration, or loss to the third compartment, for example, when happening in ascites or hematomas. Now what can be the consequence when we lose extracellular volume? Relatively, the patient does have a decreased skin turgor or hypovolemic circulatory problems that initiates the regulatory system. So increase the blood pressure, peripheral vasoconstriction, increase GFR, and so on, and so on. Hemoconcentration happening, so the peripheral uh, uh, resistance is going to increase as well. And the microcirculation, they be altered as well, so that's be abnormal. Tissue hypoxia can happen due to the hemoconcentration or hypovolemia. And of course, the kidney regulates, so oliguria and urea can happen. And decrease the perspiration, and especially when you have a heated area, you can develop hyperthermia. And very sim uh, more severely, this can happen in infants or elderly one. What will happen when we do have the opposite one, when we do have an increase of the extracellular volume? 
if we are taking for example too much fluid too much drink or too much infusion is administered what happening another thing when we do have a decreased excretional capacity for example during renal failure or renal retention of fluid due to the hormonal milieus for example mineral corticoid excess or ADH hyperfunctioning or hypersecretion now what will be the consequence usually the blood volume increase is associated with hypertension and of course hemodilution so the decrease of the hematocrit that happening edema can develop can be regional, regional edema for example in a lymphatic vessels or obstruction or flexible rubber like usually meaning the accumulation of the water absorbing molecules but can be very rigid very hard edema when usually a mucopolysaccharide such as a mixed edema it usually associated with hypothyroidism and cardiac edema so this is the different forms of edema that can develop osmoregulation the body or the plasma has about 280 300 milliosmol per kilogram and in every fluid compartment the free diffusion of the water provide the balance the osmoreceptors that is uh, found in the hypothalamus or the liver detecting the tension and regulate the ADH secretion the tonicity or the effective osmotic pressure that can be calculated or can be measured the calculation as you see here can be seen that sodium is the major component we are taking twice sodium because sodium forming a strong acid strong base so relatively sodium with chloride so this is why we are taking these two particles the sodium and chloride and carbamide or blood urine nitrogen and glucose these are those substances that can give you the calculated osmolality now if you are making the difference between the measured osmolality that measuring for example the changes of the freezing point of the plasma and the calculated one that gives you the osmotic gap that's osmotic gap about plus 10 so relatively the osmolality is higher one in the plasma than the calculated one uh, how can we detect the ions in the plasma we are using ion selective electrode and we can measure the intracellular potassium usually they are using the uh, photometric or flame photometer in a red blood cells a uh, very important one for example when we are checking the potassium it's very difficult to measure one because if we let the blood stays longer and we do have for example clot retractions or clotting the blood that can release some potassium out of for example from the plasma and this way the plasma the serum relatively has a little bit higher potassium concentration than in the plasma another thing that can happen for example if we do have a thrombocytosis that can cause a pseudo hyperkalemia or another thing that the blood sample left for example unprocessed that can again release some potassium from the red blood cells very importantly hemolytic samples cannot be measured and cannot be used to measure the potassium concentration because the intracellular potassium it's about 30 times higher than extracellular one and the hemolysis when you're blasting the red blood cells altering the potassium level very much sodium metabolism uh, the total sodium content of the body about 4.5 mole this is located 70 percent is an exchangeable portion in the extracellular fluid that takes about three mole while the 30 percent in chemically complex with bone that takes about 1.5 mole the normally the plasma sodium concentration is ranging between 135 to 140 millimol per liter the main regulator of the extracellular osmotic pressure the sodium this is why we can talk about hyponatremic or normonatremic or hypernatremic uh, different uh, electrolyte changes and that's usually reflecting the osmotic pressure as if you go back to the previous slide you can see that the osmotic activity is calculation based on twice the sodium concentration the kidney filtrates every sodium so it takes about 25 mole per day 
and that's freely filtrated. However, in a proximal tubule, 70% of the sodium is reabsorbed immediately, and additional reabsorption occurring in the distal tubule by aldosterone, so the maximum of the 99% of the sodium can be reabsorbed. So we do have an obligatory sodium loss about 1% per day. Now what can cause hyponatremia? Hyponatremia can be due to a decreased intake. For example, we are taking less salt, but it's very, very rare. Usually we are taking much more than we need it. Or iatrogenically, especially in those patients that parenterally uh, feed it. Or increased loss, that's a more common one, when the kidney relatively has an inability to reabsorb the sodium, so sodium losing kidney situation. Or when we do have an acute tubular necrosis, so the tubular system is deteriorated. Or adrenal cortex hypofunction, if we have aldosterone deficiency. Iatrogenically can happen when we are altering, let's see, the sodium balance and diuretic therapy can cause a hyponatremia. But if we do have, for example, a skin burn or perspiration that increases or to the intestine, the diarrhea or vomiting or ileus, we still can lose uh, sodium so they can develop hyponatremia. Now what will be the consequence of the hyponatremia? First of all, hyposmolarity or changed a cellular function and cell metabolism, as specifically the infer interfering with the enzyme system. Muscle contraction, so the excitability of the muscle uh, function is changing. Cellular edema in the brain, confusion, headache, congestive uh, cognitive problems or coma can develop. How can we compensate it? First of all, we do have a decrease of the ADH vasopressin secretion. We do have an increase of renin angiotensin aldosterone system. And if the patient taking more salt, for example, high salt consumption, that can normalize the hyponatremia. What can be the cause of hypernatremia, the opposite when we develop a hyperosmolarity? For example, increased intake, iatrogenic when somebody is parenterally uh, substituted with more sodium that is needed or decreased excretion such as a kidney problem when we do have a decreased GFR that can be acute or chronic enough due to acute or chronic kidney failure or diabetes insipidus when we do have an ADH deficiency for example or osmotic diuresis in diabetic mellitic patient diabetes mellitus or mannitol infusion Adrenal gland, especially when we do have a hyperaldosteronism that can be due to the Cohn syndrome or Cushing syndrome. Or secondary hyperaldosteronism, it's very commonly a uh, cause of the excess of the sodium. Heart failure, stasis in venous circulation, liver failure, ascites, nephrotic syndrome that causes edema. So these are the secondary type of hyperaldosteronism. Or stenosis of renal artery that activate the renin angiotensin aldosterone system. Or intestinal stack, for example, diarrhea, uh, dysentery, or cholera induced loss of the water, mainly hyponatribic solution. What will be the consequence? If it's happening suddenly, the shrinkage of the cerebellum and subdural hemorrhage can develop, as we discussed at the beginning or slow onset, but very gradually decreases, the ideogenic osmolite is going to develop and non-specific inhibition of the enzyme function happening and the consequence that ADH release, increased thirst sensation or decreased aldosterone secretion. So this is the regulatory system is turning on. Potassium metabolism. The total potassium content is about 3.8 mole. And that's in a free form, it's about 90%, and is a fixed form that is forming some salt with bone, and it's a brain and red blood cells that takes about 10%. The intracellular mainly is located intracellularly. So the intracellular concentration is about 140 to 160 millimole per liter. The distribution, as we said, it's usually the intrinsic balance that's coping the intrinsic balance between the extracellular and intracellular compartment. The extrinsic balance ratio of the intake and the output of the potassium.
what will be the intrinsic turnover. In the GI, for example, the GI in the potassium secretion in the stomach or absorption, potassium absorption in the small intestine and aldosterone depending potassium excretion in the large intestine. So this is going to maintain the potassium uh, equilibrium. And the kidney that is a, a freely filtrated and 90% can be reabsorbed, so we do have about 10% of the filtrated potassium that is lost through the kidney. What's going to regulate the potassium level? Uh, first of all, from the intracellular compartment. This is why any kind of changes in extracellular spaces, relatively, it doesn't influence too much the blood or the plasma potassium concentration. However, when the potassium level is elevated, the serum potassium level is elevated, the insulin secretion is stimulated and that activates the sodium potassium ATPase that is going to promote the uptake of the potassium. So this way the serum potassium is going to decrease. Another thing that the hyperkalemia regulates the aldosterone release. So and this way, in the kidney, we do have an excretion of the potassium and in the large intestine as well. What's going to cause hyperkalemia? Most importantly, the acidosis. When we do have acidemia, when we do have an increased proton concentration due to the exchange of the proton and the potassium in any cells or in the kidney, that causes hyperkalemia. Or diabetic ketoacidosis or diabetic coma when the potassium due to the inappropriate insulin effect the potassium cannot enter into the cells and this way we do have hyperkalemia. Uh, some cardiac glycosides such as the digi uh, digoxin or digitalis intoxication always is altering the sodium potassium ATPase and that can uh, cause hyperkalemia or that can worsen the hyperkalemia. It's going to happening when we do have an increased cell lysis, especially when we do have, for example, in a tumor treatment, when we have the inducing the cytotoxic agent, and that can cause a release of the potassium from the intracellular stores as well. Let's see what can lead to uh, hyperkalemia. First of all, we can have a problem with the excretion. So we do have a decreased excretion to the kidney, for example, or if we can due to the renal failure. Or another problem, if you do have a severe hypoperfusion, for example, that happening in exicosis, because to excrete potassium, we need a sufficient amount of water and sodium in the distal nephron tubules. Heart failure relatively in a minor one that is induces secondary hyperaldosteronism due to edema or when we do have for example a progressive heart failure that hypoperfusion and potassium retention can happen. Adrenal gland uh, insufficiency such as the Edison disease for example or any other thing that is antagonizing the aldosterone effect. Some drug for example and said that altering the sodium excretion or reabsorption in the kidney, or some other drugs such as the aldosterone antagonists, such as spironolactones, that again that can cause hyperkalemia. What will be the consequence of hyperkalemia? First of all, the excitability of the cells decreased. This can be reflex disorders or flaccid paralysis paresis uh, or faster repolarization of the cardiac muscle cells that can cause high extrasystoles for example premature bit formation or tachyarrhythmias. On ECG that is very typical the sign for example we do have a wide tall peak tanned T waves in the chest lid or short or missing ST segments and flat or missing P waves and atrial fibrillation can develop. Another thing is very severe condition, we can have a wide QRS complex that's about the same as a T wave. So, and this looks like as a sinus wave. And in this case, relative the ECG is going to detect twice as much the heart rate that is normally because they are not recognizing the QRS, that cannot make difference between the QRSs and the T wave. And 
ventricular fibrillation can develop so this is why the hyperkalemia or hypokalemia can be very dangerous in a case of the heart or uh, rhythm how can we treat hyperkalemia first of all the most important one to blunt the cardiac muscle excitability this is done by the giving the patient calcium glucuronate and calcium that's the bivalent ion is going to antagonize the potassium effect on the channels on the cardiac muscle cells after that infusion of glucose together with insulin that is going to help to redistribute the potassium so activating the sodium potassium ATPase is going to restore the potassium to intracellularly similarly the beta 2 agonist salbutamol has the same kind of effect if it's needed in acidemia bicarbonate can be administered very importantly in renal failure or when we do have a very highly increased potassium concentration the patient should be dialyzed immediately to avoid the effect of the elevated potassium concentration what can cause hypokalemia first of all for example in decreased intake when we do have less than 40 millimole per day the intake for, for example that happening in starvation that can develop hypokalemia or increased loss for example diarrhea when it through the GI tract we lost a lot of potassium or kidney when we do have an excretion or potassium losing kidney or an excess of the aldosterone or diuretic phase of the acute renal failure or renal tubular acidosis for example when the disorder of the tubular proton excretion the problem primary hyperaldosterone in cone syndrome or part of the Cushing syndrome or secondary hyperaldosterone when the extracellular fluid decreases and this is why we do have a secondary hyperaldosterone or when we do have a problem with the catabolism of the steroid hormone such as the aldosterone as well that happening in liver cirrhosis iatrogenically the diuretic therapy or steroid therapy can induce hypokalemia or the extracellular, extracellular potassium distribution usually is altered by the pH for example alkalemia when we do have the proton potassium exchange mechanism insulin treatment in diabetic coma for example that is going to separate or withdraw the potassium to the intracellular stores and can cause hypokalemia this is why the potassium replacement is very important when the patient is treated by insulin and a quick cellular proliferation again that can use up or can uh, store the potassium intracellularly what will be the consequence if you are altering the potassium concentration the acid base balance is altered as well vice versa so can develop metabolic alkalosis Neuromuscular impulse transmission disorders, weakness, confusion, hypotension, ileus can develop. On ECG, for example, the prolonged repolarization and a flat or negative T waves and a prominent U wave can be seen on ECGs. Or depolarization abnormalities such as the increase of the P wave amplitude or the PQ intervals in in uh, increases and widening of the QRS complex. How can we treat hypokalemia? The potassium is missing mainly from the intracellular compartment. If you do have a decreased concentration in the plasma, about below 3 millimole per liter, that meaning we do have about 300 millimole of potassium is missing in total. Water. How can we replace? with a very slow infusion because potassium entering mainly in the blood into the extracellular fluid and after to the intracellular fluid this is why the replacement should be taken by every day about 140 millimole potassium can be administered 